Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome panel members and the audience to this meeting of the Scientific Guidance Panel for the California Environmental Containment Biomonitoring Program, more popularly known as Biomonitoring California. Thank you all for participating and for sharing your expertise and experiences. The panel last met on November 18th, 2022. The meeting includes did updates on the Biomonitoring California program activities, including community biomonitoring studies. We also heard from guest speakers, Nayamin Martinez, director of the Central California Environmental Justice Network, and Gina Solomon, a principal investigator at the Public Health Institute and also a clinical professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco. Together, they presented a study called the Filtration for Respiratory Exposure to Wildfire Smoke from Swamp Cooler Air, or Fresco Mujeres, which the program is adding an exposure biomonitoring component. The panel, staff members, and audience members delved into planning for future program activities. The panel also provided feedback on current activities. Key discussion topics included, first, planning and designing the Studying Trends in Exposures in Prenatal Samples, or STEPS, project. This discussion included input on considerations for selecting counties in California for retrospective and prospective sampling. Second, options for timing of urine collection for the Fresco Mujeres project and suggestions for the types of information to be collected through the study. Third, potential topics to consider for 2023 STP meetings. A summary of input from the November meeting and the complete transcript are posted on the November meeting page at biomonitoringcalifornia.gov. I'll now invite panel members to introduce themselves. I'll call on each member and ask you to state your name and affiliation. Uh, first, Laura Cushing. Hi, good morning. This is Lara Cushing. I'm at the University of California, Los Angeles in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. And just one note, I will have to step out early at about 11.50 today. Nice to be here. Okay, thank you. Um, Ulrike Luterer. Hi, I'm Ulrike Luterer. I'm a professor of environmental and occupational health at the University of California, Irvine. Thank you. Jenny Quintana. Hi, I'm Penelope or Jenny Quintana. I'm at the School of Public Health at San Diego State University. Hey, thank you. We also have um, Oliver Fien from UC Davis, Tom McCone from UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and Carl Craner from UC Riverside, who will be joining a little bit later in this meeting. And now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Meg Schwarzman from UC Berkeley, who is our panel chair. Thanks so much. Um, I appreciate it, Vince. Um, let's see, my, I think my first task is uh, to provide a reminder to panel members that to uh, please comply as usual with the Bagley Keene requirements. So that's a requirement that all discussions and deliberations of the panel need to be conducted during the meeting and not on breaks or with individual members of the panel um, on or offline, including by a phone, email, chats, or text messages. So our goals uh, for the meeting today are, um, first, we're going to hear a presentation from our guest speaker on the use of a population-based pharmacokinetic model to help interpret the PFAS data from the CARE study. We'll also, after that, be hearing um, an update on program activities, including community biomonitoring studies. So that's a two-part update. There will be time for questions from the panel and the audience after each presentation. Um, so here's logistics for how to um, ask and answer questions and comments, provide questions and comments. Um, so during the question periods after each talk, it's great if speakers could remain unmuted with your webcam showing so that you can respond to questions from the panel and from the audience. For SGP members, if you want to speak or ask a question, please just raise your hand like physically, I'll watch you. Um, and call on you at the appropriate time. You can unmute yourself and ask your question or provide your comment. Um, I think we're all mostly used to this by now. For webinar attendees, if you have questions or comments for the question periods after each talk, submit them via the Q&A feature of Zoom webinar or by email. And that address is biomonitoring at 
oehha.ca.gov. And I will be checking in um, with staff about um, uh, questions from webinar attendees during the process. We won't be using the chat function during the meeting. So um, uh, if, you, if you put something in that way, we won't see it. Please keep your comments brief and focused on the items that are under discussion, and we'll read aloud relevant comments, um, paraphrasing them if necessary for length. If webinar attendees want to speak during the public comment periods and discussion sessions, use the raise hand feature on the Zoom webinar, and I'll call on you. So our first agenda item, um, as I mentioned, is a presentation by Matt McLeod. I'll introduce him and then we'll go ahead. So Matt McLeod is professor of environmental chemistry in the Department of Environmental Science at Stockholm University in Sweden. We really appreciate your uh, um, willingness to stay up late to attend our meeting in this time zone. Um, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and associate editor of the RSC journal, Environmental Science, Processes and Impacts. He studies the factors that control human and environmental exposure to pollutants using mathematical models to quantify exposure and design and interpret laboratory experiments and field studies. The goal of his research is to build a quantitative and process level understanding of factors that determine exposure to environmental pollutants and microplastics, and to develop practical tools and guidance that support rational management strategies. Today, Matt will be presenting on the application of a population-based pharmacokinetic model for interpreting PFAS data from the California Regional Exposure Study or CARES. I'll turn it over to you, Matt. Thanks for being here. Oh, you need to unmute, Matt. There we go. I was just saying, let me know if you have trouble hearing me. <laughs> and now that worked perfectly. Uh, so I hope you can hear me now. And you see my slides, is that right, Mike? Perfect. All good. Good, okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a bit about, um, I'm really gonna talk about 13 years, I think, of research that I've been involved in, in developing and applying what we call population-based pharmacokinetic models to describe biomonitoring data. And at the end of this talk, I will show you a few slides where we have applied this uh, modeling approach to some of the California biomonitoring data. And this I've done in collaboration with Kathleen Atfield. All of this work uh, in collaboration with um, or with the California biomonitoring data was actually possible because I came to visit uh, in Berkeley uh, four or five years ago before the pandemic uh, on a Mary Curie funded secondment, which was money from the European Union that that uh, I was awarded to find a new and make new collaborations. So. Um, that was a nice opportunity. You'll see why uh, as I go through the talk. Um, quite a bit of the talk deals with biomonitoring data from the United States. Uh, I'll only get to the California data at the end, but you'll see lots of data from NHANES as I get into the uh, into the talk. Um, on my title slide here, I have myself uh, as the presenter. Malika LaRussi did a lot of the work that you'll see at the end of the talk on the California data. She's a student who, who worked with me until recently here in Stockholm. Kathleen, of course, is our uh, collaborator there in California. All of these people at the bottom have been involved in developing this modeling approach over the last decade or so. Um, very notable in this list is Roland Ritter, and you'll see that he was the original developer of this population-based pharmacokinetic modeling as part of his PhD work uh, about 10 years ago now. So I want to start, let's see if this works. Yeah, uh, I think on this, in this panel and in this group, uh, I don't have to tell you that we all have chemicals in our bodies. Um, how much chemical you have in your body is determined by the balance between exposure and elimination. And if you want to estimate the concentration or the body burden of chemical in somebody's body, in your own body or in an individual's body, a simple way to do this is with a one box pharmacokinetic model. That's a model that just balances exposure with elimination to calculate concentration. 
So you might, for this individual, uh, estimate intake of a chemical as a function of time, and maybe if this is time in years and this is the intake of a persistent organic pollutant, there is some increasing phase of exposure, a near peak of exposure, and then a decreasing phase of exposure. And so this is your exposure function. The elimination in a simple one box pharmacokinetic model, you could parameterize as a first order process. Just assume that this elimination rate constant is, that this elimination is uh, characterized by a first order rate constant that's independent of concentration. And this works very well for lots of different kinds of uh, persistent organic pollutants and pollutants that we have in our bodies. Uh, especially when they're at low concentrations, such that you're not having a physiological response that's that's causing a concentration-dependent elimination. So this one-box pharmacokinetic model is very useful for individuals, and it looks like this if you write it down mathematically. And here, if you don't want to get too far into the mathematics, I just drew some arrows here so that you could see the concentration is in these two terms. On the left side of the equation, it's what we're solving for, the rate of change of concentration with time, in this case, in a differential equation. That's actually dependent on the concentration itself. The rate of change is just these first order elimination uh, rate constants multiplied by that concentration. Here now, I just told you that um, we would characterize elimination with a first order elimination rate constant. There's actually two here. One for the elimination rate of the chemical, which could be by excretion into urine, for example, or into feces or sloughing off of skin, all these different mechanisms. This other term is uh, a rate constant for growth dilution. Especially, this is especially important for children who grow very quickly over the course of uh, a, a certain period of their life. Uh, it can be important also uh, when you speak about demographic in a demographic sense for older populations where people tend to lose weight as they get older and you get actually negative growth and which can cause a concentration of the chemicals uh, that, that you're carrying within your body. And then the exposure part of the equation is here at the end. This is in this case, an intake function for the chemical uh, through diet, I've assumed is the, as the dominant exposure pathway in this case. Again, this is a function of time and if this, this particular one box pharmacokinetic model equation, I was set up for a lipophilic chemical that tends to accumulate in lipids. So I've included here an F factor for absorption efficiency and then the mass of lipid within the body, uh, sort of assuming that we're measuring this uh, concentration on a lipid normalized basis. Uh, you'll see in a second that we take away this assumption when we work with uh, PFAS, which are not lipophilic chemicals. But that's a one box pharmacokinetic model. Probably many of you in this group have seen this kind of model before. We turn that one box uh, pharmacokinetic model into a population based pharmacokinetic model just by running it a bunch of times for different representative individuals born in different years. So that's what I've illustrated here. Um, each of the lines in this plot of concentration now of a lipophilic chemical in nanograms per gram lipid normalized uh, concentration within the bodies of people over time. Here are nine individuals, one born every 10 years starting in 1931. So the first individual, I guess, is this blue line. They are born in 1931. They start to accumulate this chemical. I believe this chemical is PCB-155. You'll see it in a second on the next slide. Um, lots of accumulation early in life from transfers from breastfeeding. Uh, then there's a period of, of uh, growth dilution, perhaps, where concentration goes down a little bit. This is all superimposed upon an assumed intake function, which is increasing between the 1930s and the 1970s for PCBs. So you see all of these different individuals born in 1931, 1941, 1951, and 1961 with rising concentrations in their bodies over time up to about 1973, 1975, when you have peak of exposures. And then all of these individuals who were born before the peak in exposure uh, from PCBs in this case, they all start to fall 
they have declining concentrations with the same rate constant. This is determined by this intrinsic elimination half-life. People born after the peak of exposures have much lower body burdens over the course of their lifetimes because they're not experiencing this high exposure, uh, this high peak of exposure. And this is this is our population-based pharmacokinetic model. This is what it does. We put together a whole bunch of individual single box uh, pharmacokinetic models. We don't model an individual born every 10 years, but an individual born every year uh, for about 100 or 120 years. And we use this to build a picture of the population uh, composed of these representative individuals. And with that, we can then look at the population in a couple of different dimensions. So you can then look at across the whole population, the band of the range of uh, concentrations in, uh, of in this case, PCB 153 and PCB 52 now, the range in concentrations in the whole population at different times. And you can look at cross sections of the population in term as concentration within the bodies of the people as a function of age at different times. So here I took two times or four time slices out of this, these uh, population distributions. Um, one in 1983, shortly after the peak of exposures to PCBs. At the top here are graphs of the average daily intake or the adult reference daily intake for PCBs. Um, all of this data actually is, in this case, uh, parameterized for the UK population because we've used uh, monitoring data or measurement data from of body burdens of PCBs within the UK population from these two studies uh, as a case study for the model. This is also a nice case study because there are many um, whole diet intake studies for PCBs from the UK. So we can simultaneously then fit the model to exposure levels and trends, which come from uh, total diet surveys and whole body or, or uh, body burden estimates that come from analytical chemistry studies of concentrations of PCBs in the bodies of the people. And then we can uh, fit the model to both of these things simultaneously to get the best possible picture of how intake and elimination conspire with each other to determine the, the levels uh, that we see within the population. And so what we see is a changing in the shape of the concentrations with age within the population. Shortly after that uh, peak of exposure, you see almost everyone in the population over the age of about 20 has the same concentration of PCD 153 uh, in this case. Then in 1990 and in 2003 and in 2015, you start to see this plateau effect where it's only the older members of the population who have this, this uh, uh, level or, or flat level of, of uh, concentrations. That's that memory of the peak concentration. All of those members of the population have declining body burdens along that same curve. There are fewer and fewer of them as time goes on, of course, because we don't model people above the age of about 90. We're assuming that they've died. Um, this is for PCB 153, which is which has long residence time in the body, is a is a persistent uh, PCB congener. PCB 52 is metabolized and excreted much more rapidly. And in that case, you don't see this sort of memory effect of the peak exposure, but instead everybody in the population is stepping down at, at sort of the same rate. Uh, this is determined by the rate of change of exposure actually as where, because exposure is falling more slowly than the rate of elimination of the chemical. So this is the kind of information you can get from this population-based pharmacokinetic modeling approach. You get explanations, mechanistic explanations for these age concentration uh, uh, shapes that you see in biomonitoring data. You get explanations uh, or you get a mechanistic explanation that uh, of why persistent uh, 
substances have different age concentration profiles than less persistent substances or less biopersistent substances. And you get a quantif and you get a quantification of this relationship between intake and elimination in determining concentration. So this is where we started. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning about Roland Ritter. These are the two papers that Roland published as part of his PhD thesis. This is from 2009, 2010, so about uh, uh, 13 years ago now. Um, with that as background, we became, or I especially became interested in applying this framework to um, perfluorinated substances especially substances like PFOS. And the reason here, the motivation here is clear because PFOS is currently the, the most abundant persistent organic pollutant measured in humans. And this is just a summary of uh, data from N. Haynes from a few years ago, which, which takes averages of this age concentration profile for PFAS. And one of the interesting things about PFAS, you see a few things that are common with the PCBs. If you look just at men, you see this increase and then a sort of a plateau. So it looks a bit like PCB-153, a persistent uh, pollutant with perhaps long residence times in the body. Um, but you also see something interesting, this interesting difference between men and women within the population where women have much uh, lower uh, outside of the range of variability within the data, much lower body burdens than men, especially up to the age of about 55 or 60 when then they sort of come back together. So one of the things that we wanted to investigate starting around 2014 was this research question. Could loss of PFOS by menstruation explain the different body burdens between women and men? And this was a research question that was kind of in the air uh, around 2014. On the first slide, you, you might have seen the name Jochen Mueller. He's a professor uh, in Australia uh, who I've collaborated with on this work. And he was already looking at this question of uh, elimination of PFOS, especially through blood loss. He was looking at cohorts of patients who have hemochromatosis, which is a particular disease which is treated by uh, frequent um, blood removal to prevent the buildup of of uh, heavy metals in blood uh, among people who don't eliminate these uh, uh, naturally. Um, and he had noticed this difference between women and men and, and had posed this as a, as a hypothesis in at least one research paper before we came along uh, to try to investigate this question. So what we had to do to address that research question was modify our uh, population-based pharmacokinetic model. Remember, it's built on this framework of uh, individual uh, pharmacokinetic models for individuals. Um, what we needed to do was add another elimination rate constant to this K elim as, a, as an extra elimination pathway from blood loss, and then parameterize this to represent menstrual blood loss elimination by women uh, as a way of addressing that research question that I talked about before. So we did this by introducing a new term to describe losses of perfluorinated chemicals or PFOS with menstrual blood. This, this new term is just a flow rate uh, a volumetric flow rate of blood loss divided by something called the volume of distribution. Volume of distribution is, if you're a, an environmental scientist or an environmental chemist, it's just a partition coefficient, but it's a partition coefficient with funny units that measures the distribution of perfluorinated chemicals or any chemicals between the whole body of a person or an organism and the blood. So, Keep in mind as we go through the next slides, it has these funny units then of milliliters per kilogram because you use con by convention, uh, measure the whole body concentrations of chemicals in nanograms per kilogram and the concentration in blood in nanogram per milliliter. So you get these funny units of milliliters per kilogram. To keep in mind here is a low volume of a low volume of distribution means that the chemical prefers blood you have a high fraction of the total amount of chemical in your body, in your blood, a high volume of distribution. You have a high fraction of the chemical in other 
tissues, uh, other organs of your body. So PCBs, for example, have very high volumes of distribution up in the millions, probably unmeasurable. Uh, you'll see for PFOS and perfluorohexane sulfonate, we can get values here that are more like 100 nanogram per milliliter. This is a low volume of distribution for chemicals that are distributed uh, appreciably into blood uh, when you look at the whole body. <clears throat> so with this new process description, we needed to parameterize it. Men, of course, don't have menstrual blood loss as a loss pathway for PFOS. Their flow rate of menstrual blood throughout their life is zero. Uh, women have menstrual blood loss, uh, so they have a non-zero uh, loss of blood, especially uh, in these years between uh, puberty and menopause, between about the ages of 15 and 50, I believe, in our modeling framework. And just for modeling purposes, we kept a set of imaginary women within our uh, modeling framework. These were, this is the way that we modeled women in the beginning when we were thinking about PCBs, which do not distribute appreciably to blood. We didn't include menstrual blood loss originally, so implicitly we were modeling women as, as not having this as a loss pathway either. We kept them in here for comparison's sake when we started to investigate this hypothesis, but these are obviously imaginary uh, women. Um, so this is a, for this case study, we worked with the NHANES data. This was in 2014 or 2015. At that time from NHANES, we had five years of cross-sectional biomonitoring data of PFOS in men and women within the US population. We set up an initial estimate of the intake function or the, the rate of intake as a function of time of PFOS for the US general population based on product use data. We used that as an input to our pharmacokinetic model. We used that then, we used then as fitting parameters, the whole body elimination rate constant and a refined intake fraction where we just used two fittable parameters to describe this intake function. So we could then go in a kind of loop here and iteratively fit the model to the data until we got the best possible fits. Uh, and the outputs of interest then are this intrinsic elimination rate constant for men, women, and for men, for menstruating women, and for non-menstruating women, and a refined intake function estimate for uh, PFOS over time. So what this looks like, here is the five years of biomonitoring data that we had to work with in, in 2014 from the NHANES study. Men are at the top in blue, women underneath in red. This looks a lot like that first slide that I showed you. Um, men in general having higher uh, whole or higher concentrations of PFOS in their blood than women over time. Everything is falling because by, the, by 1999 already there was uh, a phase out of PFOS underway and uh, concentrations within the population are falling throughout this period. When we fit our population-based pharmacokinetic model to this data for men, we inferred a, an elimination half-life of five and a half years for PFOS. And this is the model fits in this blue line. For these imaginary women who do not have menstruation as a loss process, you can see the model fits are quite a bit worse than they were for the men. The shape of the curve is not correct. The half-life that we calculate is 4.3 years. It's faster than it is for men, which represents this sort of faster losses uh, by women, but we're not fitting the data. Uh, we're not fitting the cross-sectional data in a reasonable way. And only when we include this menstruation as a loss process do we get more qualitatively the right shape in this uh, age concentration relationship for women for the PFOS in the general US population. So. A little bit of a frustrating thing in this was um, the intrinsic elimination rate constant that we calculated for men and women, uh, for, for men and menstruating women, did not quite overlap our confidence intervals. The in, intrinsic elimination rate constant for men, this is elimination by all processes that are available to men, was about five and a half year or was five and a half years. The intrinsic elimination rate constant for women, now this is 
for loss processes that are uh, not including menstruation um, is 4.9 years. These two do not overlap. If menstruation was the only explanation for the difference in body burdens between men and women, then these two should overlap because we would have included in the model the thing, the key thing that was different for women from men. So this was a little bit frustrating for our hypothesis. If you remember at the beginning, the hypothesis we were investigating was whether menstruation explained the difference between men and women. And from this study in 2014, we concluded that it did not quite explain the difference. It explained quite a lot of the difference, but not all of it. So here's that research question. The answer is a qualified yes. Um, assuming the same intake, the model fits for data, we're just, or the model fits to data for women, uh, were just as good as they were for men. That's what I've shown here. Here's the root mean squared error of the model uh, for fits to men. This is the, the root mean squared error uh, for, whoops, sorry, bouncing around. This is the root mean squared error for fits uh, for women when you include menstruation. If you don't include menstruation, there's much higher model error. There's something missing in the model. So this is part of our explanation for saying that, that uh, menstruation is an important loss process. But these elimination rate constants that should have overlapped if menstruation could have accounted for all of the differences between men and women did not overlap. And this was uh, a little bit disappointing actually at that point uh, in our research. This study was published in these in this paper in ESNT, and there's actually a very nice comment that came uh, afterwards from uh, a couple of doctors, medical doctors, who helped us to who pointed out actually that we had parameterized uh, menstrual blood in not the most optimal way. And when we reparameterized with the recommendations from this comment, we actually got improved uh, data fits uh, with the model. So that was a nice. Uh, case of getting some outside. It would have been nice to have this, I guess, before we published the study, but it was nice to get it corrected uh, as well. Um, so this brings us up to um, Malika's work uh, and together with Kathleen. Um, when we went to, when I went to California and, and visited with Kathleen and I learned about the California biomonitoring data, one of the things that we wanted to do was as preparation for trying to compare the California biomonitoring data to the NHANES, to compare the California populations to the general US population, was to update our uh, work on NHANES. Because by 2022, when Malika started to do her work, the NHANES data had been expanded uh, in the first case. Uh, there were several new years of biomonitoring data available. I don't, did I get the, yeah, I got these correct. 2011, 2013, and 2015 were now available. And in addition, the 1999 data had been retracted, which was actually quite interesting for me because if you go back in the slides and look, the 1999 data was a little bit funny looking even in our, uh, in some of our um, population-based pharmacokinetic model fits. So we went back and and uh, revisited these assumptions. We I'll show you in a second. Uh, based on our results, we actually applied the population-based pharmacokinetic model to many more PFAS, not just PFOS, but uh, several others, using this assumption that menstrual blood loss does account for the difference between men and women. Um, a barrier to doing this to doing this kind of analysis for uh, perfluoroalkyl substances where you don't have an independent estimate of volume of distribution is that you can't apply the model without that volume of distribution information. So I'll show you in a second <clears throat> with these new data. Here is an example. So here's the update for PFOS. Uh, again, men in blue and women in red. Now, what we had previously was 1999, that data has been rescinded or taken back by the NHANES people. Uh, so the same, we have the same data from 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2009. And then for PFOS, there's a, just two more years of data from 2011 and 2015. Here are the model fits <clears throat> for these data. 
here is the intake function for PFOS from the optimized model. It shows basic, you know, this is negligible intake, uh, intake rising exponentially between about 1950 and 1990, then a peak of intake between 1990 and 1998, and exponentially falling uh, exposures after 1998. The, these model fits for men and women. Now I'm only showing menstruating women. I'm not showing these imaginary women who don't have intrinsic elimination half-lives of 4.3 years for men and four years for women. These do overlap when we use a volume of distribution for PFOS of 250 milliliters per kilogram. This is a, a value that's in very good agreement with other independent studies and in good agreement with what we used before in the 2014 study. So now we were in a case where um, menstrual blood loss does account for most or for enough of the difference between men and women that it seems like a reasonable assumption for other PFAS to use the model fits to estimate volume of distribution. Here's the root mean squared error plots for PFOS and actually we fit the women in these new and Haynes data with a little bit higher, a little bit lower root mean squared error and a little bit higher uh, coefficient of determination than we do the men. Um, there's a few sort of technical reasons why that is the case, but if any of you are really interested in models and data analysis, we could talk about it in the questions, I guess. Um, here's PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid. Similar story to PFOS, um, again, uh, volume of di distribution of about 250 or 260 uh, milliliters per kilogram. So you see quite a difference between women uh, and men, women between the ages of about 15 and 50 uh, and men. Uh, again, the inferred intake function. Now the elimination half-life for PFOA is a bit shorter than it is for PFOS. Remember for PFOS, this was a little more than four years. And now for PFOA, it's more like three and a half uh, or three years. But again, there's uh, not such a large discrepancy between the women and men uh, in this uh, analysis. And again, the model fits for women and men are both uh, quite good and comparable to each other. Now for PFNA, uh, perfluoronononanoic acid. Already in these in the biomonitoring data, you can see that the difference between men and women for perfluorononanoic acid is less dramatic than it was for PFOA and for PFOS. And if you remember what I was saying before, a low volume of distribution implies a high affinity of the chemical for blood. This smaller difference between men and women implies that perfluorononanoic acid is less you know, has a higher volume of distribution, meaning higher affinity for other organs relative to blood. Uh, you do see that this is 300 compared to about 250 for PFOS and PFOA in our model fits. The intrinsic elimination half-life is quite similar uh, to those for PFOS, something around four years. Um, again, we get an inferred uh, intake function. An interesting thing now is even in this pharmacokinetic modeling, we're seeing now for perfluorononanoic acid, a later start of the decline, start of the decline in exposures. This is now in the year 2007. You can see this in the biomonitoring data, 2003, 2005, 2007. All of these biomonitoring years look quite similar. If anything, there's a little bit of an increase in concentrations during this time. And then you don't see a decline starting until 2011, 2013, 2015. This is in contrast, if you look back to PFOA or PFOS, where we had declining concentrations right through the biomonitoring series. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Um, yeah. Sorry, this plot is missing. I realized when I made up the slides, actually, that I had the wrong um, plot here for the men. And rather than show the wrong data, I just deleted the plot. Um, but uh, you have to trust me that the uh, fits for men and women are comparable uh, for perfluorononanoic acid as well. Here's perfluorodecanoic acid. Um, once again, a later start of the decline in exposures. Um, now you see an even smaller difference between men and women. It's getting hard to even detect 
visually in the plots. This volume of distribution of 600 milliliters per kilogram, much higher. Um, and again, the model fits in for men and women are comparable. Perfluoroundecanoic acid, similar to the perfluorodecanoic. Uh, again, quite a high volume of distribution compared to PFOS and PFOA. Uh, and then finally, an interesting one, perfluorohexane sulfonate. Now you see a very dramatic difference between men and women. Um, this corresponds to the lowest volume of distribution that we've seen for any of the substances that we've looked at so far. Again, quite a quite a high biopersistence uh, here, um, but uh, very strong uh, affinity for blood relative to other organs for perfluorohexane sulfonate. Um, hey, so, hey, Matt, this is Stephanie. Sorry, we're yeah. um, a little bit over. I was wondering if uh, maybe we can talk I'm about very... care data and- Yeah, okay. I will jump there. I'll jump, over the, I'll jump over the inferred uh, volumes of distribution. Um, the, the summary of this is our volumes of distribution are, are consistent with many of those reported in the literature, but not all. Um, and then, so finally, then here's the, the uh, care uh, biomonitoring data to put this in context. Um, I think you guys in this group will be familiar with these data from uh, 2018 from LA County and from 2019 from a Southern California population. What I've done is just added them to the bottom here. Um, so across the top here is the PFOS uh, and Haynes data that we saw before. And then using the same uh, exposure parameters and elimination parameters, but fitting the intake functions to these data, we can get very good fits to the 2018 and 2019 uh, cares, uh, care data um, for PFOS, for perfluorohexane sulfonate, again, showing this big difference between men and women attributable to low volumes of distribution. And I only showed those two examples, but we've done all of the PFAS that I talked about before um, in, in comparing uh, the California data to the NHANES data. So under the assumption that volume of distribution and whole body elimination rate constant are the same in the California populations and in the US general population, we test the hypothesis that there is different exposures in California and we don't see obvious evidence of that. There's a few cases where there's uh, some differences, but the, the care data is these are much smaller data sets than the NHANES data. So it's a bit difficult to say where um, just variability from small sample size or smaller sample sizes is, is causing a bit of a discrepancy. But there isn't an obvious uh, difference in the uh, intakes between the California populations and the general US population, at least in this first uh, application of the model. So with that, I could come to conclusions. Sorry, Stephanie, for going a bit long. Um, but what I wanted to illustrate here was this population-based pharmacokinetic modeling as a tool for interpreting biomonitoring data. Using this, we can, for perfluoroalkyl uh, substances, get estimates of intake levels and trends from biomonitoring data and estimates of intakes where they're available. And the model delivers estimates of intrinsic elimination half-lives and volumes of distribution for these substances. And I'll end there. I have a, I have an acknowledgement slide, but these are all European funding agencies that funded my travel. So I don't think that they're familiar to many of you or European projects that funded my travel actually. Great, thank you so much, Matt. We have time now for um, questions from panel members and from the audience, and then we will have a longer open discussion period. So um, for the moment, let's do clarifying questions. Um, from uh, webinar attendees and from panel members. And panel members can just raise their hands. I see Ulrika and um, Jenny. And so we'll start. Go ahead, Ulrika. Yeah, thank you. That was a really very interesting talk. Um, I have one question or kind of, it's kind of two questions. The first part is, I may have missed this, but so when you modeled menstruating women, did you assume that after a certain age, like 50, that was no longer a source of loss? Yes. Exactly. Okay. okay. There is a there is a dynamic function in the model where the there is uh, 
no menstrual blood loss before the age of 15, and then it stops after the age of 50, I believe. Okay. And then the second question is, what about loss via lactation in women as another possible source? <laughs> yeah, these are, this is very... These are great questions <laughs> because there is also lactation and there is also um, childbirth and, and blood loss associated with childbirth and just birth and just the child itself. And uh, Kathleen has actually opened my eyes and pointed me to a few studies where there are uh, statistical correlations, at least, where women with higher parity have lower uh, PFAS concentrations. And it is all, it is significant enough that I think we should be able to see it in the population-based pharmacokinetic model. We have not, so far I have not included that in any of our model scenarios. It's comparable, the, the lactation and uh, depuration due to breastfeeding is probably, in, based on my, my best guess on this at this point, the lactation and, and uh, depuration due to breastfeeding is probably smaller than the blood loss uh, associated with childbirth and the, and, and the birth of the kid itself. Um, but I think that this is something that I want to investigate a bit more. I think there is a chance that we could even further, ex now we're talking about explaining variability within the, the cohort of women in each age. And what we might need is instead of just one representative individual born each year, for, for women, we might need three or four who have different parity over their lifetime to get a, to see if we can explain that range. And I think that would be the first step toward answering this question, at least in our model framework. I think there's other independent studies that say that this is an important depuration process for individuals. And then the question is how important is that at the population level that, that we would be interested in getting at? It sounds okay. like a complex um, balancing because, of course, there's amenorrhea during pregnancy um, and amenorrhea during breastfeeding. And so, um, you know, exactly. a complex com give and take. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. some women experience significant blood loss during uh, delivery and some don't. Um, Not. So I, I respect the complexity <laughs> of modeling this is part that of the reason process. That this is part of the reason that I've not tried to take it on quite yet because the, the model is useful for looking at things at a population level. And I, I've been sort of hoping that at the population level, all of this would, you know, but what we do see is this difference between men and women. This is the first thing we were interested in. Trying to explain the difference between women is a, another level of complexity lower, which is, uh, yeah, which we haven't tried to tackle yet. Jenny had a question. Hi, one of my questions was the same as Ulrika, which was regarding lactation, which you already answered, but I also was thinking at a population level that women, at least in San Diego County where I live, are tending to have children at an older age. And so not only is it lactation an issue, another complexity with the age at lactation, um, which is changing at a population level, I think. And so I was just thinking through those, those complexities, but so that was one question I had. Another question I had was, what was the effect of um, increased body mass or obesity and population changes on the volume of distribution as well? And yeah, any comment on that? This is a super interesting question, actually. Um, we have parameterized the model with, uh, age body weight data from the exposure factors handbook. And this is fairly, you know, it represents a snapshot in time from uh, whenever the, I, uh, now I'm not 100% sure which version of the exposure factors handbook we used, but certainly there are changes in uh, obesity with their obesity rates, which are, which, were, which are affecting this. Uh, I mentioned it at the end, actually, if you look back in the slides, you see for the very oldest age group of men, especially, you see a rise in concentration at the end. And this is because men in their 80s and 90s tend to shrink quite a bit uh, in this exposure factors handbook. So there you see an increase in concentration. Across the whole population, I think it's a more difficult question to say what this whole shift towards higher obesity is causing. Um, I'm not sure that it's causing a change in volume of distribution. Uh, but it does 
have implications, I think, for at an individual level, at a population level, I think it's harder to say. I wonder, I don't, I don't have a great answer, I guess. It, it's interesting, but it's not something that we've looked at uh, yet in model scenarios. Thank you. We have a question from Jean Wynn. Go ahead. Thank you very much, very much, Mashu. And then this modeling working as everyone noted, lot is a very complicated work and very useful. So my question is, do this first order chemical reaction modeling or the pharmacokinetic modeling, it, you know, I believe the major purpose is to interpret the data, what we already found with the laboratory by molecular data we collect, it, instead of predict the future levels. And uh, so my basic question is how to use, why is a good time to use modeling? Why is a good time to use a real laboratory monitoring? How these two, um, two functions, two measurement help each other? Great question. <laughs> I think we need both actually. Um, a really interesting thing in the modeling is, um, you, you might have seen all of my exposure curves just had two phases and in, well, three phases, an increasing exposure phase, a plateau, and then a phase of exponentially declining exposure. At some point that exponentially declining exposure is going to stop. And we're going to reach a point where even though we've, we've phased out all of the obvious sources that were causing contaminations of the food supply or, or drinking water, and we're going to reach, uh, especially for these very persistent substances like PFOS and PFOA and perfluorohexane sulfonate, we're going to reach some plateau of exposure that we won't go below. And the modeling cannot predict where that plateau is. You need to continue to do biomonitoring to find where what you know where that uh, where there is no longer possible to reduce exposures just from the actions that we've taken to to. Uh, restrict or ban PFOS and, and perfluorohexane sulfonate. So the model can tell you what this will look like. It will look like a flattening again in the, in the, uh, in the decline rate, um, but we don't know when it will happen. We have to continue to monitor to find out when and at what level. Thank you. Any other panel clarifying questions? I have um, one um, question in the Q and A. I see, I see it. Should I? Can everyone uh, see yes. it and read it, or should I read it? I think so. I think everybody should yes. be able to read it. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I could just summarize. Oh, my, it's a question. I, I'm actually. I'm not sure that the attendees can see it, so oh, maybe okay. just read it out loud okay. first. That's I'll a good just point. summarize. And also yeah. for the uh, transcription, yes, that's a great thank point. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. The the question is asking about whether there is an opportunity to compare the model, especially for this hypothetical group of non-menstruating women to a population of women who really don't menstruate because of contraceptive use, or there are women with very low uh, body fat, for example, who don't menstruate. I think this is a, this is a, this would be useful <laughs> if we were really interested in, in that subpopulation of women. Um, I think the, the other way to frame this question is how well does the model work for men who who have blood loss, regular blood loss? And there are men like this who are these hemochromatosis patients, for example. And there you do see that they have uh, body burdens of PFAS that are lower than the general population. And there's even been some studies with highly exposed populations of firefighters. There's a nice paper uh, that came out a year ago that looked at a population of firefighters from Australia who gave blood regularly and reduced their body burdens of uh, perfluorinated perfluoroalkyl substances at a rate that was much faster than the general population by giving blood regularly. So I think uh, like from a validation point, of, like 
depending on how you want to interpret this question, <laughs> if you're very interested in this particular subpopulation, of course, you could do modeling and, and do uh, measurements uh, of these non-menstruating women. But from a model validation point of view, it's equally interesting to look at men who have regular blood loss for other reasons and see that they do actually have lower body burdens uh, or, or enhanced elimination of the perfluoroalkyl substances. Okay, um, I think we can um, move on to the section where we just have an open discussion period. Um, and a reminder that um, both panelists and uh, um, the audience members can ask questions or provide comments and um, webinar attendees can do that through the Q&A or um, through the Biomonitoring California email. Um, and we'll do this until we have a break at uh, 1120. Comments or reflections? Yes, please. Uh, let's see, Jenny. Hi, um, thank you again for the talk. I'm just thinking about what you mentioned about the importance of biomonitoring and modeling and how they can intersect or inform each other. And I was also thinking about I could hear your thoughts about if we had deviations from your model, are there times you think this could indicate a pre previously unknown uh, exposure pathway, for example, or or could it inform um, uh, hypotheses we should be investigating and, or something like that? I'm just curious about what it could tell us. I think so. And I wonder, Kathleen, if you want to weigh in a little bit also, because Kathleen and I have discussed a little bit <laughs> about, um, especially in the California population, about whether we should look, for example, at um, Asian subpopulations or subpopulations with a high number of immigrants who might have had a different exposure history than the general US population. Um, you know, there's reason to believe that exposures in China are much higher than they would be in the United States in the last decade or two. And so recent immigrants who've come from China, for example, could, uh, an interesting hypothesis to test would be to look at that subpopulation and see if there's evidence of higher exposures. Um, I think this was one of your hypotheses, Kathleen, that you thought about, but I wonder if you want to comment on a couple others. Oh, sure. I was just going to confirm what you're saying, that we've seen that with our Asian Pacific Islander uh, community exposure studies, which is actually a nice little seed because I'm going to bring it up later in uh, the later talk. Um, so we've seen higher levels in PFAS in the Chinese Americans and Vietnamese Americans that were part of that study. But we've also seen it in both um, Care LA and Care 2 in California. So it's it's interesting, but uh, we'll have to figure out how to work it into what you're what you're modeling that. Yeah, so there, I, I mean, I, I think that, and, sorry, uh, add just a little bit more to that. We were seeing difference in time spent in the in the country and for those uh, born outside the U.S. versus inside the U.S. So there is this concern about differing body burdens that people bring to you know. Set, uh, a state that has such a high immigration population, immigrant population. I think for some of these, for many of these kind of questions, the more powerful modeling tools are just going to be the purely statistical modeling of that an epidemiologist like Kathleen <laughs> would apply. Because um, with this mechanistic modeling, um, you need quite high you know, when we're looking at the whole, when we're looking at population averages, we need quite big populations to iron out the inter-individual variability. And actually the statistical analysis that epidemiologists do will get at those kind of questions, will get answers to those kind of questions at P less than 0 0.05, quite a bit quicker or, or on, on much smaller sample sizes than we will with our mechanistic model. So I think there's a role there for, for different types of modeling uh, for investigating different types of hypotheses. Matt, do you want to look at the two um, points that are in the Q&A and restate them and respond to those? 
Okay. Or I can go ahead and um, just say them out loud just so it's easier for the transcriber. Yeah, um, thanks. <laughs> so we have one question. Uh, wouldn't looking at women that don't menstruate versus women who do help to prove this point better than looking at men who bleed? Well, I don't know about better, but in addition, the, the problem with this is I don't have access to any data from non-menstruating women, <laughs> where I do have access to data from men who give blood regularly. So I think this is correct, that this would be another line of evidence. I don't know that it's better, but uh, the, the, the practical barrier is that I don't have access to those data. So maybe it's an academic a, question. Yeah, oh, go a ahead. clarifying point about that. When you say you don't have access, is it that like within NHANES, you don't know who is menstruating and who isn't, so you can't separate the exactly. populations? Yeah, exactly. I mean, beyond, over 50 and under 15, but there we just assume. But within the population of uh, women of childbearing age, I don't, I don't have uh, access to the information. Yeah, and, and for the men, it's have... a case of it's not population studies. It's uh, you know um, campaigns where they're looking specifically at those groups. So it's not actually population biomonitoring, but um, uh, exposed groups. Understand. And um, in, in, in general, NHANES does also not include um, information on parity. Now, maybe there's better, there's people who are more expert on NHANES than I am, but I don't believe it does. I don't believe that you can link parity to the, but maybe Kathleen, do you know if that's correct, if it's possible in NHANES to link parity to the individual measurements? Um, I actually don't have that information on hand, but I would believe they would collect it. And is it and and it can be associated with the individual measurements? Maybe maybe there's someone else who knows more about NHANES than I do. Well, I would say we definitely have that information for care. Mm. So that is something that we could add mm. to the care component. Well, and I'm thinking about some of the um, sort of sub-analyses that have been done on NHANES data looking at um, chemicals that occur in pregnant women. So there must be NHANES data that identifies, um, that, that connects individual data to pregnancy status at the time, at least. Yeah. That, so I think that would be a really interesting point. That would be a good extension about. then as a way of, yeah, yeah. Stephanie, do you want to do the next Q&A? Yep, um, and this was just a comment from um, Dr. Hinsa Porta Samchai, um, which says that research conducted on elite athletes exposed to air pollution and heavy metals found exercising muscle aids and excretion. That's interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, on the one hand, because of what we were talking about, about the, the elite athletes who maybe don't menstruate, but uh, this corresponds with my own experience where if I drink too much coffee and then I go out for a run, I feel much less uh, hyperactive from caffeine overdose. <laughs> so I believe that from a personal point of view as well. I'm not an elite athlete though, I would say. Maybe Stephanie, I could use this pause just to ask you if there's, um comments via the uh, email that we should check in with. Uh, nope, nothing from the email. So other questions or comments or discussion points um, from what we've seen. One thing I'm curious about is just thinking about this, um, the metabolic pathways question for different substances. This is sort of extending it to other categories of pollutants and synthetic chemicals that we find in people, like the example that was just given in that um, point is for metals. And I, I don't know detailed information about how metals are eliminated, but certainly, um, you know, they're not carried in blood the way um, PFAS are. Um, 
And I just wonder if you have reflections from your experience with working on these models and varying them for different contaminants, um, what some of those different elements are. There's, you know, um, whether a substance is lipophilic, whether it's, you know, excreted through kidney or metabolized in the liver, or um, does it go to bone the way metals tend to? Does it go to blood like PFAS, et cetera? And just if you have any kind of reflections on that. I think this is a great question because this is where I think the mechanistic modeling is most powerful. Like we we talked earlier in about um, some of these questions about different exposures in subpopulations where it's probably just straight statistical modeling that's going to be the most efficient way to answer the question about whether Asian and Pacific Islanders, for example, have higher exposures than the general population. But these kind of questions about different elimination pathways that might be relevant for different types of chemicals, you can only answer with a mechanistic model. And that's where this like menstrual blood loss as a pathway for loss of PFAS is a nice example, because this is different than the PCBs, which are uh, more traditional lipophilic compounds that have very high volumes of distribution. So blood loss is immaterial to your rate of of elimination of PCBs. And instead, what's important is, or what's back when we did that work on PCBs in the 2010s, actually, we were very interested to see whether we would see a dose dependent elimination rate constant for PCBs, because it's you know quite well documented that for PCBs and dioxins, if you get a very high dose, you can have uh, chloracne and you know, where, where the body is, you activate detoxification mechanisms within the body that I assume are evolutionarily designed to uh, help you to eliminate uh, these kind of lipophilic toxins. We didn't see any evidence of dose-dependent elimination in the general population in, that, in those studies for PCBs, which kind of makes sense because this was general population. It wasn't anybody who was having these activations. But those kind of questions you can only get at with a mechanistic model. So now I'm out of my depth a little bit because I've never looked at metals myself. But if you have hypotheses about, um, you know, different elimination pathways for metals that you could build into the model, you can test those hypotheses with the model to see whether you improve uh, model fits for subpopulations where these are important. So I think that this is a a good use of modeling and a good use of this mechanistic modeling. Um, the other thing that came in my mind when you started to ask your question was, for the PFAS specifically, there are actually other possible explanations for the differences between men and women. And they could be accounting for, if you look back in the slides, uh, even in the newest with the newest and Haynes data in the new model fits for PFOS and PFOA, especially um, the intrinsic elimination half-lives for women are still a bit faster than they are for men. And we haven't done our complete uncertainty and or error propagation analysis on this yet. I don't think that they'll be statistically significantly faster for women um, given our uncertainties in other parts, but there could be something still in there. And in, animal studies, like in rats, rats, female rats don't menstruate is something I learned when I started to do this work. But yet you still see faster elimination of PFOS and PFOA by female rats than males. And this is attributed to um, differences in hormone balance that determine differences in efficiency of reabsorption of PFOS and PFOA in the kidneys, which is very interesting. And I think it's possible that there is some version of that type of mechanism also operating in humans. It's against a background of this bigger difference between males and females associated with um, persistent blood loss, but it, but it could still be there. Um, and it's still something that could be teased out, I think, in this modeling. There's still room in our modeling for that kind of mechanism to be active in humans, I guess, is what I want to say. Thank you for that. It's interesting to think about how um, 
how to apply mechanistic models to other classes of substances. We have about 10 more minutes if others have discussion points or questions, comments. Stephanie, um, I'll do one last check about um, email questions or comments. And then um, is your preference to break, uh, take our break 10 minutes early or take a longer break to stay on our published schedule? I think we would just um, take a longer break so we can stay on our published schedule. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll see if there's, there's nothing in the email um, right now, but if anyone has a, a question or comment in the next minute or two, please. Yeah, we have one that just oh, came in. This is a helpful a helpful comment about the availability of parity information, only for a subset of women. And I'll I'll just read it out loud. It's um, a comment from Dina that says, "Comment on pregnancy and NHANES parity is available for a subset of women who completed the reproductive health questionnaire." And then also, um, pregnancy status at time of exam is suppressed for women under twenty and over forty four years old. Hmm. Jenny. Hi, I just um, was thinking maybe to recommend a more inclusive language in talking about subjects. There are people that identify as men, people that identify as men who menstruate. And so I just uh, was thinking perhaps um, going forward to frame it perhaps a little bit differently, but thank you. Do you have any reflection on that, Matt, given that um, it's another uh, point of complexity because um, there what you're referencing is physiology and some of that is connected to um, gender assigned at birth, um, unless there's um, um, you know, gender affirming care <laughs> in process that changes hormonal functions and associated physiologic functions. I mean, hormonal levels and associated physiologic functions. So um, I appreciate Jenny that it raises um, kind of points of like being clear about that. Maybe that um, in addition to um, inclusivity of the language, there's also sort of specificity of the um, designations and the way they point to physiologic processes. So gender assigned at birth is um, more specific, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any specific thoughts about how to do this. I'm open to suggestions on how to do better in describing this, certainly. Uh, so I'm open for suggestions. Um, <laughs> I would say mostly we're talking at the population level here. So, but I'm I'm open for opinions or suggestions on how to, on better terminology, certainly, and how to be more precise about this. And Kathleen, Kathleen do you have an idea, maybe? I was going to more address Meg's second point, um, just to say what information we have avail available that's pertinent to this for the CARE studies. So for CARE LA, we only asked about gender, but for CARE 2 and CARE 3, we asked both about um, gender and sex assigned at birth. So for CARE 2, um, there was actually a 100% correlation between the two, um, so we would not be able to look at, at any um, distinction between the, the two types of identification. And CARE 3, of course, was a very small uh, number of participants with what was the beginning of the pandemic. Jenny. To add briefly that I was not, um, I know what data you have is kind of how you're characterizing your analysis. I'm just saying when I hear you talk about it's women who menstruate and men who don't give in our discussions in our classes with our students at the School of Public Health. 
it just seems a little jarring to me and I think it would be to them. Um, that's all I meant, not that you have necessarily control over what data you're analyzing. So just to put it in context. Yeah, I wouldn't want to. Ooh, okay, I have to think a bit about how to say this in a more precise way, because definitely there are men who menstruate. Nerissa. Um, just to add to this conversation, thank you, Jenny, for your comment. Um, I think just there's a whole world of um, of realities of health and identity, and I think describing women as imaginary who don't menstruate. There is an entire world of women who don't menstruate for varying reasons or, you know, who are different phases of their lives. And you acknowledge some of that through the framing of 15 through 50 um, and then post menopause. But I think just, um, it, it just feels a little dismissive to consider them imaginary. Um, and so just be cautious in your language. Um, and this is kind of going field from the study design, but um, just because we're very careful to um, acknowledge that different people exist and have health consequences. And we want to just be precise in our language about how we talk about them. I have a, I have had another comment on this related to this actually, because, and even in our paper, we, we have this thing, which is called the intrinsic elimination rate constant. And we have defined this intrinsic elimination rate constant to be elimination due to elimination processes that are common between men and women. And I have had women tell me that this is poor framing because menstruation is intrinsic to being a woman. <laughs> um, this was some years ago, maybe before there was more of this discussion about so I, I I don't know I I I I find this uh, it gets a little difficult to do it in a way where you make everybody feel included all the time simultaneously I would say but as I said I'm open for suggestions on how to do better. Any final questions or comments or additions to the discussion before we take a break? Seeing none, I um, want to thank you, Matt, for um, your time in what is your evening um, and for bringing us your study results and explaining it um, and how you've applied it to the care data um, gives us a lot to think about. Um, so we will have a break now until 1130, just a reminder to um, return promptly so that we can, because we'll start right at 1130. And um, with that, we'll start our break. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much for your presentation, Matt.